of the message, being a professor and teaching, you know, uh, I like, you know, titles, and I'm always writing down. I don't know if some of you are like that, but I'm giving you the title of the message today for those that like to write down. Uh, Jesus Christ, friend of sinners. And uh, our passage, I want us, if you want to open your Bible, otherwise I'll read the biblical text. It's uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verse 10. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And the central theme, basically, that what we're going to be looking at for the next half hour, 40 minutes or so, uh, Jesus ministered to many of the marginalized during his days on earth. Jesus ministered to many of the marginalized during his days on earth. And we're basically going to be looking at five social groups in Jesus' day. The first one is lepers. Second one has to do with foreigners. Third will be women. Fourth will be children. And finally, tax collector and sinners. I'll repeat that for those of you that want to write or are writing. First group will be lepers. Second group will be foreigners. Third group will be women. Fourth will be children. And finally, tax collectors and sinners. Lepers, Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. And I'm sure that a number of us are familiar with this passage or these passages, so it's not going to be something new and great revealing that's hidden. You know, there are passages that are well known, but I want us to understand a couple of things. First of all, I want us to see the social perspective. What society in the day of Jesus thought of these different social groups? But I also want to compare that to what Jesus thought and how he acted towards these people. And the social perspective during the day of Jesus was that lepers were ostracized and they were outcast. They weren't part of their normal family setting or being part of their group because of the fact that uh, they were lepers. And we see in this passage in verse 12, it says, As he entered a village, speaking about Jesus, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. See, the law during Jesus' time prescribed that people with skin diseases could not live in close proximity to others. Leviticus, those that want to open their Bibles in Leviticus 13, verse 45 through 46, but I will read that passage. This was what it demanded and it required during Jesus' time. As for the leper, leper who has the infection, his clothes shall be torn and the hair of his head shall be uncovered, and he shall cover his mustache and cry, Unclean! Unclean! He shall remain unclean all the days during which he has the infection. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. In other words, ostracized. Not looked upon favorably. Shunned. And, you know, to a certain degree, it sort of reminds me, especially during the first uh, years of AIDS, globally, someone had AIDS, not only was it a death, death sentence, but many people just, you know, they didn't want to have anything, anything whatsoever to do with people. And I would dare say and compare that it was the same in Jesus' day as far as lepers. And the leper did not actively interact with his family, friends, and others. He or she was condemned to a life of total isolation from loved ones. Friends and relatives were now other lepers. Being a leper was a constant torment. Can you imagine what it must have been during that time? Knowing that, let's say you were married, you possibly could never embrace your wife again or be with her or your children. Maybe you had a favorite son or a favorite daughter and you could never embrace and be with them because you were a leper. What a life of torment that must have been during that time. However, I want us, as I mentioned before, to look at Jesus' perspective. How did Jesus deal with all of this? What did he do? 
that was so different. Because Jesus was different. Jesus was radical. Not only politically, but also socially and spiritually during his time. And we see in the text, it says, go and show yourselves to the priest. In other words, Jesus had compassion for them. Yes, when they approached Jesus, the first thing they did from afar was follow Leviticus. And they said, unclean. Unclean. Like letting everyone know and letting Jesus know, hey, I can't hang out with you. I am totally unclean. But Jesus, again, had compassion on them. And he showed compassion. And we see how all ten lepers obeyed Jesus. He told them to go show themselves to the priest. And scripture says as they kept on walking, they were clean. All ten of them. Can you imagine the feeling of rejoicing that must have been for them? They present themselves to the priest and they're clean. And all ten had the faith to be healed. And we notice that all ten were healed. But only one, only one came back to thank Jesus. And Jesus asked them, weren't, weren't there ten of you? What happened? I mean, where are the other nine? And only one came back. And the one who returned fell on his face at Jesus' feet. And the Bible clearly says that this person was a Samaritan. Not only was he a leper. And you talk about outcasts, but he, this guy, I don't know if there are any baseball players or fans for this illustration, but it had two strikes against him. He was a leper, but he was also a Samaritan. See, because the Samaritans during Jesus' time were looked at half, well, not really Jews, you know, they're sort of half-bloods, half-Jews. Uh, they're not really pure like us. I know that doesn't happen here in Asia. I know it doesn't happen in many of our countries, in school local settings, but it did in Jesus' day. Can you imagine that? They're not like us. They're not as pure. They're not as smart. They're not as like we are. The man was a leper. He was a Samaritan. And this is the only one that came back. And later, Scripture calls him a foreigner. And what that literally meant was he was a non-Israelite. He had nothing in common not with the nation of Israel at that time but he's the one that came back and Jesus said ask them about the other nine as we saw and Jesus affirmed the leper by saying stand up and go your faith has made you well and Jesus testified that the man gave glory to God you see God has a different strategy and different math than we do God sees the intentions of the heart. God doesn't look at colors. He doesn't look at nationalities. Jesus Christ, Christ died for all men, Scripture says. And we see how very clearly here, the one that Jesus had compassion on all ten, but only one was grateful. Lepers, first social group. Second was foreigners, Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. The perspective in Jesus' day was, first of all, the centurion was an officer from the occupying Roman army. He was not only a foreigner, but he was part of the occupying army. I mean, again, to use the baseball illustration, two strikes against him. To some Gentiles, to some Gentiles were not part of the people of God. Three strikes against him. He was a foreigner. He was part of the occupying army. But the religious people even deemed him as totally unclean because he was a Gentile and they had nothing to do with him. This passage is more to do with the inclusion of the foreigner or the Gentile. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And the nations, then the exclusion of the Jews. To the self-social perspective of that day, some would consider Jesus a traitor for associating with a centurion. In other words, Jesus, why are you hanging out with a centurion? Don't you know he's part of the occupying force? Don't you know that us Jews, good religious Jews, have nothing to do with Gentiles? 
But again, Jesus was against the culture of that day. In addition, the, the centurion was uncircumcised, uncircumcised. And the centurion was considered totally unclean by religious Jews. But Jesus was different. And Jesus continues to be different today. Although Jesus ministered mainly to Jews, he did not exclude the non-Jew. Some example are the Canaanite women, woman that were familiar in Matthew 15. The Samaritan woman of John chapter 4 who came to the well. And Jesus just sat down and spoke to her. And did something totally inappropriate. When it gets to get the culture of his day. Speaks to her. And they started. It's a, it's a wonderful story. It's a wonderful story of about reconciliation. And Jesus just reaching out. To a woman. Of ill repute if I may use that term. In this morning. Ostracized. Five husbands. Oh gosh. One's bad enough for two, me. <laughs> but five, and the one you have is in yours. Boy, you talk about scandal. Boy, that, that'll make the news. But the woman finally accepted Jesus. And not only accepted Jesus, but she went there to the water fountain. And she had her jar to get water. And she left it right there and went to tell everybody. You know, I don't know about you, but sometimes I hear that women don't have uh, ministries. You want to see an evangelist? Right there. Right there. She told the people of her town what Jesus had done. And many came to know him. And later the people of her town said, before we, we accepted what she said, but now we know you are the Savior of the world. All because of one woman, supposedly a ill repute, that accepted eternal life in Jesus. Jesus ministered to non-Jews during his time. We continue on. His perspective, I'm sure that Jesus knew this passage in the Bible in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 32 to 33, when King Solomon dedicated the temple. And it says this, also concerning the foreigner who is not from your people Israel, when he comes from afar for your great namesake, and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when they come and pray towards this house, then hear from heaven, from your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name, and fear you as your people Israel, and that they may know that this house, which I have built, is called by your name. And we know after this prayer, immediately the presence of God just filled the temple. And the priest and King Solomon and everyone just had to leave. The favor of God. But this is part of the prayer of the dedication. God continues to look and reach out to the nations. It's not something just done by professions. I'm a professional missionary, I guess if you want to call it. You know, I travel throughout the world and my wife and I, we develop leaders and disciple people throughout the world. And that may be my profession or that's how I make my living, whatever you want to, however you want to say that today. But see, God has called all of us to be missionaries, to cross barriers, to be his disciples, wherever, wherever we may be. It's not an accident that you live in Hong Kong. It's not an accident that this is one of the most multicultural cities in the whole entire world. God is planning and raising up men and women in all parts to join Him in His mission. And it does not make any difference what language you speak, what culture you're from, what you eat, as long as you're willing to say like the prophet Isaiah, Here am I, Lord, send See, because one day, if we look at the Bible in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9, 10, and 11, from every tribe and tongue, there will be men and women there praising the name of Jesus. 
So this, I mean, I, I rejoice seeing all the different shades and colors, and I would imagine some of you speaking different languages. I rejoice because this is what heaven's going to be like. This is what heaven is going to be like. We're going to be from every tribe and tongue and just worshiping the Lamb. The Lamb. Why? Because He died for all people and all nations. And we see how Jesus marveled, was marveled by the centurion's faith. And Jesus recognized the centurion publicly. And Jesus called the centurion and other Gentile sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A taboo and a no-no in Jesus' day. But again, Jesus has always been different. He always has been different and he continues to be different. Jesus included Gentiles as part of the covenant people in this text. Third group, women. Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. Luke chapter 13, verse 10 through 17. Social perspective in Jesus' day. In Middle Eastern society during Jesus' time, the man was considered superior. I know that doesn't happen here in Asia. I work a lot in Latin America. In Latin America, we talk about machismo, the macho, you know? But here in Asia, that doesn't happen. Sometimes a woman had some social prominence depending on whom she married. However, the price to pay for such status was possible abuse from her husband. Women did not own property during Jesus' time. The more mature women and widows were respected to a certain degree. However, there was a prayer that said, Thank God I was not born a Gentile, a dog, or a woman. True. Very true in Jesus' perspective. But again, Jesus was so different. This passage says, Woman, you are free from your sickness. This is a woman that for years was a paralytic. We don't know exactly which, you know, exactly what it was. Maybe she was a paralytic because she couldn't walk or hunchbacked or crap something, we really don't know. The Greek text doesn't give us that much information. But what we do know is that when Jesus ministered to her, she healed and she got up. We do know that. And the healed woman immediately glorified God. And not only glorified God, but also praised Him. Let me tell you a little quick story. April 14th. 2009. I was in my office. I live in the Midwest. I sit in the Midwest, uh, the city of Des Moines, Iowa. I don't know if anyone's been there. Anybody? It's all right. Don't feel bad. I mean, it's one of those places. If you're not, if you know, it's not like Chicago. It's not like New York. It's not like Miami. It's a small little city. Usually, you're there either for business or someone that you know. But it's a small city in the Midwest. City of approximately. 300, 350,000 people. And uh, that's, that's where it's home for me now. As a matter of fact, it's the smallest city I've ever lived. I was raised in New York, lived in Madrid, Spain, 18 years. From there, I went to uh, Los Angeles, and all of a sudden, I land in Des Moines, 350,000 people. It's like, where are the people? There's <laughs> you know, traffic, you're traveling 40 miles an hour, roughly 65 kilometers an hour, and people say, look at all the traffic. Traffic? <laughs> it's like, but anyway, that's, that's where it's home, and that's where God has called me. And uh, it was April 14, 2009, Tuesday morning. I went to the bathroom, and uh, after I came out, I noticed that there was a little bit of blood in the water. And uh, I didn't pay attention to it. And uh, when I came out, my wife saw me, and I was very pale. I was white. And she said to me, what's wrong? So I said, no, honey, I'm fine. And you know, being a good macho man, you know, we, we don't get sick. Women get sick, you know, but men we really don't get sick, right? Well, some of us, let me put it like that. So I said, now just give me a glass of water. Took a drink, but I was feeling dizzier and dizzier and dizzier. And uh, I said to her, well, you know, take me to the doctor. She, she drove and we were going to, towards the office of my doctor, our doctor. 
And then all of a sudden, I, I was feeling even worse, and I said to her, honey, take me to the emergency room, take me to the hospital. She took me to the hospital, they immediately put IVs, and the doctor gave me some very good counsel. And we see how the Lord was in all of this. But he said, we don't know exactly what's happening, but we'll admit you today. And if, uh, you know, if it's nothing, tomorrow you can go home. But if it is something serious, at least you're here and we can uh, attend to you properly. Rather than going home and maybe if it is something serious, uh, by the time you get, get to the hospital, something really great can happen to you. And I thought it was smart, my wife did also. So, uh, I was admitted that night, I mean that morning, in the hospital, at 9 p.m. on April 14, 2009, I had to go to the bathroom again. When I went this time, all of a sudden, it was like a pool of blood all over. I hemorrhaged within 24 hours, seven units of blood. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't know what that meant back then. I did research after that. But the human body has somewhere between 9 to 10 units of blood. So in 24 hours, I hemorrhaged more than 70% of my blood. I was bleeding. It was from this side. The doctors didn't know exactly what was causing it. And for the next two days, I had wonderful <coughs> doctors and everything, but they didn't know. On Thursday, the 16th of April, 9 p.m., <coughs> surgeon comes in and said, we have to operate tomorrow because otherwise you will die. We don't know what's happening, we don't know what to do, but we have to, we have to operate tomorrow. And I said to the surgeon, the specialist, I asked her, I, well, I said to her, listen, we're Christians, would you give us just 24 hours so we can pray? And to my amazement, she said, you know, that seems like a good idea. <laughs> I mean, those of you that know the medical profession, usually it's very rarely, I don't know about here, but it's very rarely in the United States that a doctor would say something like that. Later I found out that she was a believer, she was a Christian. But I said, okay, started calling people, email, Facebook, people from all over the world started praying for me. A friend of mine, pastor from Miami, called me. Uh, I had called him, he wasn't there. He called me, when he called me, I told him what was happening. He said, let me pray for you. Took my cell phone, uh, my wife was with me. Uh, he prayed for me, and my wife decided to go home because at 6 a.m. the next morning they would operate and she had to wake up early and come to the hospital to be with me. And as my friend prayed, all of a sudden, the Spirit of God uh, just brought to my attention, to my memory, the woman with the issue of blood. And those of you that are not familiar with the story, you can read it in Mark chapter 5, verses 25 through 34. And I took my electro electronic Bible and I started reading verse 25, 26, 27, 28, got to verse 29. And verse 29, basically, after the woman touches Jesus, it says, virtue came out of Jesus and she was freed from her affliction. And at that moment, when I read that, I just stopped reading the Word of God. I took my left hand, and I put it over this side, and I said, Lord, I know you did this for this woman. And I asked him, Father, in the name of Jesus, touch me. And in that instant, I was healed. Amen. The surgeon came in, the surgeon came in the next morning with her team of specialists. We don't know what happened. We don't understand, but you're normal. You're okay, you're fine. And of course, that was a window of opportunity to speak to them and tell them that uh, the Lord had healed me. Why do I say this? Because God continues to heal. It was not only in the day of Jesus. My blood pressure was down to 60 over 40. I don't know the units that you use here, but it was 60 over 40. Later I discovered that 60 over 40 is either coma or death. I mean, that's how close I was. My hemoglobin was down to 7.2, the same. Point of coma or death. But the Lord touched me. Amen. And I'm here. And I'm here with you. Can I, this is not a ghost. <laughs> you're not seeing any spooky thing. I mean, you know, if you invite me to eat, I will eat with you. And if you give me fish, I will eat fish also. Just like Jesus did after he resurrected me. 
But I share this because God continues to be in the healing business. Amen. God, can, yes, give the Lord a hand. And we see, as it says here, that the synagogue leaders became indignant. You know, when God some, does something, the enemy always tries to sort of distract and take away from that. And then, you know, the synagogue, the leaders of the synagogue, the religious leaders, and Jesus called them hypocrites. Oh, man, that's a tough one. You know that little gentle baby Jesus sometimes that we want to pray? I mean, portray? You know, here he is telling the religious leaders and calling them hypocrites. The crowd, however, rejoiced over the glorious things done by Jesus. Fourth group, social perspective of children. Boys were valued more than girls. The oldest son received a double inheritance in Jesus' day. And the daughters did not receive an inheritance per se. The daughters received the dowry, which became part of the marriage ceremony and later was pertained to the husband and the family. And scripture says Jesus became indignant. In other words, he was angry. It wasn't just, oh, come on, guys. You know, why don't you shake ball? Come on, guys. I mean, you know, these are little kids. Let them come. He was indignant. He was very angry. And he was moved. And that was because the disciples had rebuked the children. And the tree, children were treated unfairly. And Jesus reproached the disciples. And Jesus took the children into his arms. Had compassion. And it says he blessed them. He blessed them. We need to be a blessing community for our children. I heard one amen. 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 We need, okay, we're waking up. Or we're hungry. Excuse me, I don't know. We need to be a blessing community. Not only for our children, but also for other children. We live in a throwaway society. It makes no difference in my travels. I travel roughly 80,000 miles a year. And whether it be Asia, or whether it be Latin America, North America, children in many societies are throwaways today. Throwaways. Parents don't have time for them. Spend all sorts of things and entertain them and Give them this, give them that, when they can, of course. Don't have to speak about slum children. I'm sure you know about many of the areas of Asia, of Asia where there are slum children. That's their way of living. Latin America isn't excluded. Neither is North America or Europe. But we need to be, the Church of Jesus Christ needs to be a cute community where children will be blessed. Amen. Where children will be honored, they will be loved. Because Jesus took the children into his arms and he blessed the children. Finally, fifth group are tax collectors and sinners. Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. Tax collectors were hated. I don't know really a country where tax collectors collectors are really low. Anyway, I don't know, maybe it's different here. Maybe everyone in Hong Kong just, oh, my taxes, wonderful. I get to pay them. Does that happen here or am I? No, okay. no, I say that because my wife, I just spoke to my wife a couple of hours ago and we just did our taxes and now we got to pay the government. So, oh, okay. It's part of our duty. We will do that. But tax collectors, you know, usually aren't like very much. And in Jesus' day, even, it was even worse. Tax collectors would pay the tribute to Rome and add some for their own personal gain. Let me explain this a little. During Jesus' time, there were, of course, the occupying force. Somebody has to pay for those soldiers being there. So it was the people. So they would have recruits or people from Jewish society, tax collectors, who uh, the Romans would say, let's say a thousand, I'm just using a figure off the top of my head, you have to pay a thousand US dollars. Uh, so they would collect the taxes for a thousand, but of course they would add a little more, which they kept in their pocket, which they 
Uh, in Mexico, we say mordida, the bite. You know, literally means the bite. But um, tax collectors were really hated and despised because the Jews or Israel as a nation was paying ta taxes to a foreign government. But on top of that, as I mentioned before, it was not only a foreign government, they were uncircumcised. So it was a double whammy. And tax collectors, collectors had contact with the Gentiles. Jesus' perspective. In this chapter, it's curious because Jesus speaks about three lost things. First of all, the lost sheep. I would imagine many of us know the story. There was a shepherd, he had a hundred sheep, one of them got lost. And I don't know about you, but I'd say, well, you know, it's sorry, sorry. one out of 99. I mean, do the math. But it says that Jesus, the shepherd, left the 99 to look for that one lost sheep. And once he found it, it says he rejoiced. Then there's a second story about the lost coin. A woman lost a coin. And uh, she searched all over the house and finally she found the coin and she calls her neighbors and says, Hey, I found that coin. And the last one is about the lost son. The son who did something that was totally insulting in his day. He asked his father for the inheritance. It probably would have been better if he would have spit on his father's face than ask him for the inheritance. Because that was a total sign of disrespect. And it was a sign of also saying to, to the father, hey, I wish you were dead. But we see how the father gave son the inheritance and the son was a party animal. I mean, that's what we would call him in the Bronx in New York City, party animal. You know, he just squandered all of it. He had a happy time. Wonderful, enjoyed himself. But one day he ran out of money. Because that's what usually happens to party animals. That usually happens. It happened to me in many ways. You know, you just start spending money, whether it be to get high, whether it be to, you know, the lifestyle, impress people. But he ran out of money. And then he said, uh oh, what do I do? Well, he got himself a job. And what was the job he got? Something that was an abomination to the Jews. He worked in a pigsty. And I don't know if you've ever been or seen a pigsty, but I mean, that's filthy. I mean, that is filthy. I live, as I mentioned, in Iowa. In Iowa, uh, one, we're one of the major producers of pork, so you have pork farms, I mean, industrial-sized pork farms. And you know, you can be driving miles away, miles away from that. And on a warm day, you get this aroma. <laughs> and you start looking at yourself and wondering if you bathe that way. <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's, it's filthy. It's filthy. And he found himself there. But the Bible says one day he sort of woke up and he said, even the servants of my father have more to eat than this. And he went back to his father. And then scripture says, as his father saw him from afar, it's curious to know, instead of the son running to the father, the father ran to him and rejoiced. And that, what a picture of God. What a picture of God's love in the midst of everything. And Jesus is telling this story about the lost son. And then he finishes by saying, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Jesus' perspective, Jesus broke the social norms of his day. Jesus also broke the religious norms of his day. And he sat at the table and ate with tax collectors and sinners. And I will conclude with a story. It's a true story. About uh, 15 years ago, approximately, I had to fly from Des Moines, Iowa, where I lived, to San Francisco to do a conference uh, for men. And uh, it was one of those airlines, you know those cheapy airlines? I mean, you save money, but you don't even get peanuts. 
<laughs> I mean, sometimes you just gotta fly, man. I don't fly first class. I mean, I'm not complaining, you know, God meets all my needs. You know, but there were those airlines that, hey, you know, it's 150 bucks. It's coming out of your pockets. And you said, well, so it was one of those airlines. And on top of it, you didn't have your own seat. So it's first come, first serve. <laughs> you know? So I, and, and, and to really top it off, it was two hours late. So I wasn't in a happy mood. Yeah. You can tell people Dr. Nick from time to time gets, gets a little indignant and angry. And I, that was one of those days, it was just, oh man, two hours late. Well, they finally open up the gate, go out to the plane, and I'm, I'm short. I mean, obviously, I mean, I don't have to say that. You know, you can see that. And, uh, but I always like the aisle seats. You know, I can sort of stretch out. You know, short legs, but still, it's a little more comfy. So I always look for aisles, and when I fly, I, I try to get an aisle seat. And I saw an aisle seat maybe row four or five in this plane, and I ran to it, sat down, and I just said, ah, praise God, good. And I just wanted to sleep. I wanted to rest because I had, a, like I said, a conference and I had things to take care of, so I just needed to rest. Plane takes off. I sort of close my eyes. An African-American gentleman sitting next to me. Another, a, uh, an Asian gentleman sitting next to him. And I'm sort of just getting ready to snooze off. And I hear, ha! <laughs> Just like that. I'm serious. I'm very, very serious. And I mean, I was startled. I was, uh, I said, you know, and of course, you gotta be cool and nice. You know, you don't tell this guy at all. I mean, I, you just don't do that. You don't tell him, get out of my face. You don't tell him, hey, leave me alone. No, you, hi, how are you? you know? And, uh, hi! And he tells me, my name is Earl! And I don't care if he would have told me his name was Pontius Pilate. You know, I just didn't want to deal with it. So, oh, that's nice. And he goes, what's your name? And I said, my name is Nick. Glad to meet you. Oh, you live here? Yes, yes, I live here. You know, that type of thing. And you're smiling. And inside you're saying, oh, God, do something. <laughs> and uh, he asked me, so what do you do? I mean, this, this, this was literally the way it was, you know, going on. And I said, oh, I know how I'm going to get this guy. I'm going to tell him I'm a preacher. Because you tell people you're a preacher. Like that. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> you tell people you're a preacher or a pastor, and it's like, oh, okay, excuse me. You know? <laughs> they got to act, I don't you know, they act all sorts of funny. So I said, I'm really going to get this guy. So I said, well, you know, I'm a preacher. He goes, a preacher? I'm, I'm a Christian. And he gets up in the plane and starts singing a falsetto voice of crazy grace. And I'm like, Lord, be me up, please. I'm ready. Right now, Lord, the second coming, hallelujah. This is a true story. This is a true story. And, you know, all of a sudden, I get the smell of alcohol. You know? And it's like, oh. God, I'm drunk. No, Lord, please. Not two and a half, three hours with a drunk. I mean, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. So he kept on talking and smiling. You know, that kind of thing. And uh, I sort of beam up one of those desperate prayers. Have you ever had those moments that you just get desperate and you just say, Lord, please? You know? And I said, Lord, please put this guy to sleep. Do something. And he fell asleep. <laughs> I mean, you, you would have seen Dr. Nick, you would have said, hallelujah, what a man of God. I mean, this happened. It really, really happened. And I'm like, oh, thank you, but you know, real religious and very nice. And uh, about an hour later, Earl wakes up, and he starts telling me his life story. That he had backslidden from the Lord. That uh, he was going to San Francisco to be with his daughter, who he had abandoned. Etc. 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 And can I be honest with you this morning? My heart had turned religious. I didn't. I had forgotten all the times that I used to get high. I had forgotten all the times that I was obnoxious with 
people. I had forgotten all the times that I was drunk and I would be, not Dr. Nick, I would just be obnoxious Nick. I had forgotten all of that because Jesus had claimed me in my sin, but I became religious. I became religious. And God had next to me Earl, this guy who had backslidden, and we just grabbed each other's hands at that moment. We prayed for each other and wept. Really, true story. God changed my heart again that day. Because it's so easy to forget as church what God has done. Oh, we're appreciative. It's good to celebrate and do all the things that we do here and worship the Lord. I'm not opposed to that. Don't hear that at all. But sometimes when we leave our religious environment and we go out, we forget where God has taken us from. Because the Bible says, all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. All of us. And all of us, as I mentioned before, are nothing more than beggars telling another beggar where there's bread and that eternal bread is Jesus Christ. Amen. The bread of life. See, Jesus was a friend of sinners. He didn't approve of their behavior. We should not approve of the behavior of the world, but we need to reach out and have compassion. Because we are the eyes, the mouth, the hands and the feet of Jesus. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus Christ is still seeking, finding, and in the saving business. Let us pray.